Today is Sunday, November 15, 2020. I want to talk today about what I was covering the last couple of weeks. And I hope I can give you some information that might be helpful for your prayer. The the whole objective of learning your faith in detail is to come to God. You can't come to God in a sense. You can't love Him unless you know Him. And to know Him properly helps the soul to love God above all things as we are commanded to do. So it is good and it's a good foundation to know how to love God and to love Him properly. And if we do, if we, if our life is adjusted based upon this, this fact of a, in a sense, supreme love of God above all things, above all people, then God will favor you. God will draw your soul, is what the spiritual authors talk about. That, that need. People think that, or may think, that prayer, in a sense, has to do with feelings, emotions, positions, how I hold my hands, how I genuflect. And there is a little truth in it. But in general, it's not a sign of our holiness, of our closeness to God, when we have feelings because of externals. And I don't want to go into that in detail right now. I'll leave that for some other time. And I may have covered it before. But the way to God is first and foremost not through those things. Those are beautiful graces that God often gives to souls, especially at the beginning of their first conversion, in order to draw them away from the things of the world so that most people as we are and have been, we, in through our upbringing, we get very attached, we have gotten very attached to things of the world, to people, to the quality of our life to the things of life, the comforts of life, the pleasures of life, the joys of life. And then when a person starts to decide through a conversion, a first conversion, that these things are shallow. And to truly come to God, I need to refocus my attention, my life, and direct it towards God. And in order to do that, or as they do that, the things of the world must, in a sense, take a second step or a second place in their life. The things of God must take over. And so what does God do? He often at the beginning gives the joys not of the world. He gives the joys of the Spirit, the consolations of the Spirit, the comforts of of the Spirit, the pleasures of the Spirit. Why? Because... Otherwise, there'd be such a void in a soul that is is still weak, that the soul will not persevere in the in the giving up of the things of the world. So, if you read in some of the Psalms and the spiritual authors, you will see how they point out, and you'll catch it sometime if you're attentive to it. The fact that what happens is God, or I should say, the soul gives up the things of the world through mortification, through penance. It's difficult. And then God replaces it with some of the joys of the Spirit in order to draw the soul, to give the soul some comfort in its, in a sense, desolation. And then the spiritual writers talk about it at the next conversion, especially and the third conversion, I should say, more especially, because there are three conversions in life. The 
especially at the later ones, then God often takes those joys of, that he gave at the beginning and he removes them. Why? Because a soul that truly loves him and he understands true love, he created it, in a sense. He is love. He created the love, for example, in the heart of a mother for a child. It's all a reflection of God, of God's love for us. But later, God wants us to be loved. He wants to be loved by us for himself. Not for his gifts. So, after time, let's say after years of conversion, through our first conversion, and after that time that we take it seriously, if God starts to take away the joys of the Spirit, rejoice and be glad, as the scriptures say. Because it's a sign that God wants to wean you. He wants to give you true joy. And that's not it. It's a start. It's a sign. But it's not it. So, the point that I'm trying to make is that through everything you learn, which I'm going to get back to about sin and all that, and contrition and predominant fault. It's all on my list. I just got sidetracked here for a little bit. And it all leads up to this, though. To love of God and prayer, union with God. That's what it's all to lead to. And God will give not the, the let's say, the early joys. He gives a far greater joy later after the soul goes through the later conversions. And he gives them joys and comforts in a sense along with trials and tribulations, sufferings. Those things will be there. And I will try to point that out. Now, talking about prayer, my, I got two aspects that I want to bring up. Two aspects of this. And they're both difficult to express. The first one I want you to hear, as you probably know, you may know this, receive, O Almighty Father, Almighty and Eternal God, this spotless victim, this spotless host, it's called hostia in Latin, for the first prayer of the offertory, when the priest holds up the paten with the bread on it. It's only bread. But he calls it the host, this spotless victim, in view of the fact, in few moments, it will become the body and blood of Christ, the victim. And the important part here is to always remember, which I, your unworthy servant, offer to thee, my living and true God, for my countless sins and negligences, on behalf of all here present, for all Christians, both living and dead, that it might profit both me and them unto life everlasting. That prayer sometimes is very good at leaving the soul in a state of Perfect love, in a sense. Per perfect prayer for the whole of the offertory and even going into the, the canon of the Mass. Just that one prayer. And so, what I want to start with then, based upon that, and also, I did want to make a comment about last week's class, which, the remember we talked about indulgences, the indulgence of God, in 
removing and forgiving the debt based upon our love and our confidence, our pleading, which is so strong with God. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. As our Lord said once, I, I do not say I will ask the Father for you, because the Father himself loves you. So much that he sent his only begotten Son. This comprehension of God's love, what our Lord is pointing out, is think of your prayer not as praying and trying to bend the arm of a stingy God, of a distant God, who is so offended by my faults and my sins that, in a sense, I have to plead with him in a way that a, a murderer would plead with the judge and the jury to not be put to death. It's not that way. God wants to give. But the problem is, let me make the comment first about the indulgence. When you think of indulgence, don't think from what I said last week that you shouldn't say prayers that are indulgenced and do them with great devotion. Continue that. It's a great act. It's what God wants because it comes from the church. The church gives us these things. So, for example, after the death of a loved one, do the stations of the cross. You get a plenary indulgence. You can apply it to the poor soul. Do it. Do it with love and affection. And you could remit all the punishment due to the sin of that person if they're in purgatory. <clears throat> now, what I want to express to you is something that some could get offended with, in a sense. But, believe me, I only say this not with you in mind. I, what I want to express now is something that is, in a sense, shamefully my own. And it came to mind to me to warn you of something that I have found in myself. Unfortunately. And that is and that's part of the reason I brought up this prayer from the offertory. I, thy unworthy servant. We don't understand the significance of the words of our Lord here. For without me, you can do nothing. And the whole point of what I want to say right now, that the first half anyway, is based on this, that I have caught myself more than once. And I would say this is a long-standing attitude deep down inside that I didn't catch. I wasn't aware of. Because of my pride, maybe. And I want to warn you that this doesn't come to you at times. Especially if we attempt to go through the steps that the Spiritual writers talk about in terms of conversion of soul. The first conversion. The second conversion. The second conversion starts getting into a conversion that takes place by the grace of God. Which man, by ordinary grace, cannot enter. Cannot go through that door. The first one you can, by ordinary grace, they call it. Second one, no. The third one, no. But for those who start to purge and go through the first conversion, dedicate themselves more to God, what can happen? I can explain to you what can happen. So I'm kind of familiar with it. 
What can happen is you can get deep down in your soul in what people call the subconscious in a sense. It's an attitude that's down there which we don't often criticize or critique. Nor do we often want to because it's sometimes hard to look deep into the soul. And I know I have caught, and I bet this is not uncommon for others, that you find, potentially, that you're more, that, that the, the story of our Lord about the Pharisee and the publican is more true than you thought, and more applicable to yourself, possibly, then you wanted to admit, far be it from me to be like the Pharisee, that I have that attitude. And I would say, absolutely, none of us are like that. None of us would go up in front of the church, stand there and say to God, I am not like the rest of them. And I wouldn't ever do that myself. However, this parable of our Lord, this story, I found is more revealing than I thought. And to some who trusted in themselves as just, just that alone, not despising others, for example, that's not... <clears throat> Even the worst part of it. But trusting in our good works. Trusting in my penance. Trusting in, I follow the rules of the church. I follow this. I do that. And it's like when I, sometimes you come to your prayer and you say, God, you have this feeling potentially. This is hard to express because, and I don't know if I'll get the point across to you or not. But you come to your prayer potentially with a little bit of an attitude that I have a right to be heard by God. That God should hear my prayer because I, I try to live according to His law. I try to go to Mass when I'm supposed to, when I'm able. I try to receive the sacraments devoutly. I try to go to confession often. I do all this stuff, all these things. And so when I kneel down to pray to God, I believe there is a lingering attitude of I deserve based upon what I do to receive an answer to my prayer. And so I've had to ask myself, how come so many of my prayers that have been long don't appear to be answered? What is it in me that isn't right I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not so much as lift up his eyes towards heaven, but struck his breast, saying, Be merciful to me, a sinner. And as the offertory prayer says, I, thy unworthy servant. I'm just pointing out something that struck me at one point in time at least that maybe my attitude is not what it's supposed to be in order to receive well the gifts that God wants to give me so for example God says ask and you shall receive seek and you shall find and this in a sense is absolute this is an infallible statement of our Lord in terms of us. And one author specifically said, he points out, and I never thought of it, when you pray, he says, ask and you shall receive. Now, it's a little different if you pray for your neighbor. Why? Because when you pray, the, the understanding is, when our Lord is saying this, ask and you shall receive. The understanding is that you are asking properly for the proper things with the proper dispositions. 
Does that make sense? With the proper dispositions, with that that perfect humility of understanding that I am an absolute pauper. And anything that I may have already received from God is not due to me. Without me, our Lord said, you can do nothing. It's not due to me. Now, this gets into a, a big question, but I think all of you understand it because I've explained it before about cooperation with grace. You must cooperate, yes. But just remember, always remember that your cooperation is still by grace. It is the grace to be able to correspond with grace. Your cooperation is based upon an actual grace. And all the spiritual writers will tell you and, st- and say that without actual grace, I don't care how long you've been in the state of grace, without receiving actual grace, you will not remain for long in the state of grace. You need actual grace for that. The continual prompting of God to continue in grace. This was from a beautiful author. How to attain to this life. This is about the this is at the end of the first conversion, basically. We must remember, first of all, that prayer depends especially on the grace of God. So if you want to learn prayer, it's dependent first upon God's grace. Hence, we prepare for it far less by processes which might remain mechanical than by humility. For God giveth grace to the humble, and he makes us humble in order to load us with his gifts. He wants to. He wants to make you humble. And I'm, I'm pointing this out not because I have some thought that you have this problem in the sense that I believe I have had. I have no clue or consciousness of anything like that. But to warn you, to consider this as a best foundation for your prayer. God will not load anyone with graces to lead him to the higher levels of prayer without a a deep, profound humility from the point of view of understanding. The grace of God is still that. It is that. It is God's grace. And he makes me. He wants to make us all holy. It's the objective of creation. To make saints. To glorify Him. And when we don't realize before God, when we don't admit, even if we don't have the attitude, but if we don't admit to ourselves and to God that all you give me is from you, Lord, I would start to think, or would think, that God will be a little bit more Resistive in terms of giving us the graces he wants to give. If we don't have the attitude of deep and profound understanding of my utter, complete dependence on God. So what? There is something in here. Let me read a little of this and there's something else with this that helps us on, to understand the proper attitude to bring to our prayer. So that your prayer, from your perspective, will be everything it needs to be to draw down God and his grace, his mercy, his love. To remind us of the necessity of humility and simplicity or purity of intention, Christ said to his apostles, unless you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven especially into the intimacy of the kingdom or into the life of prayer. 
where God wants to draw your soul. He wants you to remember where does God dwell. You've redeemed us, O Lord, in your blood, and you've made of us a kingdom for our God. Our our Lord says, your, your soul is a kingdom for God. By grace, he is dwelling in your soul. It is the seat of his kingdom. He is there. But as St. Teresa points out, if you read some of her work sometimes, she points out that there are many mansions in your soul. And you are on the outside, in a sense. Attempting to get into the inner mansion. And God is dwelling in the very center mansion of your soul. And you have to break through each of these mansions. In a sense, if you want to figure it that way, you have to get over the moat with all the alligators and the crocodiles that are protecting You have to get the drawbridge down that you might cross into the next kingdom that is closer to God. He wants you to come in. That's where that picture of our Lord knocking, behold, I come, it says in the Apocalypse, I come and I knock. Think of it in reverse. Our Lord's inside. In the center. This is how St. Teresa points it out. He's in the center mansion. And he may knock. But we are on the outside so far, in a manner of speaking, that we don't hear his gentle knock. God always comes gently, peacefully, with very little disturbance. And that's why if our life is disturbed, if our life has a lot of activity where we don't have time to reflect deeply in peace, peace of mind, peace of heart, peace of conscience, we will never find him as we're supposed to. God himself is pleased to instruct immediately those who are truly humble of heart. Such was the peasant of ours who remained for a long time in silence near the tabernacle, in intimate and wordless conversation with our Lord. If we love to be nothing, to accept contempt, and not only accept it, but even end by loving it, we shall make great progress in prayer. We shall be loaded with gifts far beyond all our desires. If any of you, or me, learn something just from this, then everything I've tried to do this whole year has been worth it. Because I think this, no matter what we keep saying and talking about as we go, because there are more and very beautiful and important doctrines, but this is one of the hearts of the life of prayer. This is one of the hearts, the center point that God is looking for. And without it, he will give, but very sparingly. This is what the authors talk about. And what he often does is he gives and then he receives and he gives and he just to keep the soul, to keep the soul close to him, but not as an intimate friend, not as a spouse. Just like a child, a young child. As we know, that these are beautiful analogies because God gave them to us in nature and we're supposed to use them. A young child comes to his mother and he's hungry. And he expects everything from his mother. But 
But he doesn't say to her, Mom, I know that, you know, maybe you don't want to give me lunch today, but I'm hungry, Mom. Would it be okay if I eat something today? It, I didn't express the analogy exactly right as I wanted to. Um, what I'm trying to express is that the child has perfect confidence in the love of his mother to give him what he needs. To give him everything that the mother wants to give him. And that has to be our attitude with God. I come to God, not with things like, I offer you this that I have done, and therefore I'm asking in return that you do this for me. Give me this grace. Give me this, what I need for my earthly existence as well, in order that I might come to you more easily, more perfectly. Because the things of the world, if God gives them to us, can be and should be used in order to open the door, in a sense, to allow us to pursue that which is most important, the interior life, prayer, divine union. So God wants to give these things, just as a mother wants to give gifts to her child, the food that it needs. God wants to give it as well to each of us. And so, when you come to God, the best way is to come to Him, in a sense, with an empty, an empty heart. Lord, I have nothing but my nothingness to offer you. I am needy, and you are rich. I am poor, and you are bountiful. So what is, what prompts you? What do you bring to God to prompt Him to give you everything you need for holiness of life? Give Him your nothingness. Give Him your emptiness. Give Him your poverty. Give Him your weakness. Lord, I offer these to you. This is what He, remember what He said to St. Catherine of Siena? You should remember if you read her book. Our Lord said, God the Father said to her, I am who am, and you are she who is not. You are she who is not. That's all of us. What he is expressing is just as I am everything. As he told Moses, I am who am. Who should I tell sent me when I go to the Pharaoh? Tell him, I am sent you. That's why when our Lord said, I am to the Pharisees, they tried to stone him. Because they knew it was a perfect expression of himself calling himself God Almighty. Because he, they said to Pilate, this man, being a man, claims to be God. That's why they put him to death. I am who am. I am infinite everything. And you are nothing. You have nothing to offer me in a sense except your nothingness. Your poverty. Preparation for the life of prayer depends not only on humility but also on mortification which is the spirit and practice of detachment from sensible things and from self. Now this is going, in a sense, a, a little off the track of what I was trying to express today, but it is the next step of that first conversion, that mortification and that penance helps to draw the soul from the things of the world to draw it to God. Because God doesn't share himself. If we remain attached, especially in a sinful way, but I'm even saying in a less than a sinful way, but we are attached to the things of the world, they will hold you from God.
Alas, our great misfortune in prayer is that we know not how to treat with God, as seeing him who is invisible, nor how to ask in faith, nothing wavering. Although our Savior has solemnly promised, if you shall have faith and stagger not, and if you shall say to this mountain, Take up and cast thyself into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. This is true with the understanding of bringing the right attitudes to your prayer, the right dispositions of soul, the right, in a sense, place of where I am in the scheme of things with God. No matter how great you become, how holy you become, how detached from the world, we are always still completely unworthy servants. And we need to keep that recognition. And if we have it, believe me, God will draw you to himself. No doubt we must also pray. This is from Lehodi, from the Ways of Mental Prayer. No doubt we must also pray with a lively sense of our misery and unworthiness. For the prayer of the humble pierceth the clouds. The Lord gives his grace to the humble and resists the proud. Pride is hateful before God above all. This is right out of his book, I think near the end. Pride in poverty is especially hateful to God. What does, that's exactly what I'm talking about. We think we own something in the sense of what we've done. In a sense, like the Pharisee. I mean, you, have to, you understand, I'm talking very delicately. Not in a crude fashion that we've seen pi people in the world that are proud to the point of out of serdom. I mean, and they say things. You can catch a proud man very easily. The things they say are so astronomical. But in this little way, because little things, as St. John of the Cross points out, just a thread holds a small bird from getting off the ground. It doesn't take much. But humility must not destroy confidence. In other words, your confidence is based upon your nothingness. God, I come to you with my nothing. I need you. To raise my soul. If you want to be glorified by me, which is the purpose of creating me, why did God, the first chapter, Catechism, why did God create you? Be, to show forth his glory. To show forth his goodness. To glorify himself first. Because any holiness in a man is directly and specifically applicable to God himself, who can take a creature who is amongst a world of evil, as we find ourselves today, in and outside of the groups, even those that are supposed to be holy. And things are very terrible. And we wonder sometimes, how will our children be able to survive in the world in which... I think our grandparents said the same thing about their children. And their grandparents probably said the same thing about them. Because things have been getting bad, especially since the Middle Ages. Read the books. You can see it. I just read one the other night from the 1700s or 1800s, talking about how bad the world was getting. How are we going to survive? And by the grace of God. It glorifies God more when he raises up a saint when the world is not good. More than when the world is good. Catch the point? It glorifies him. God, this is why you made me. So you still want to make me a saint. But I must cooperate. So, pray. Lord, give me the grace to cooperate. Give me the grace to see my nothingness. To understand better, most perfectly, that everything is from you. And the only thing I can offer you, O oh Lord, is just like a little child comes to its mother and sits on its lap, the lap of its mother, 
the child expresses just by its being there. And it's so beautiful to see. When a little daughter sits on the lap of the father, it moves, it just moves you to see a beautiful scene like that. Nothing is said. The daughter just sits down on the lap of its father and the father holds it. Now, if there is any better analogy of prayer, it's that. The child has a complete sense of its need of the parent. It has nothing. Even if the food is on the table, a young child doesn't know what to do with it. Daddy, feed me. Give me something to eat. It's too beautiful for words. It's too hard to express. And then, when you think about it in terms of yourself, and when in your prayer and you come to God this way, what can the person say to express the beauty of the way God set up life, human nature, the needs of human nature, our littleness, our humility, our suffering, our sinfulness. It all comes down to this, that God might be glorified and he might be loved by a little poor creature as myself. What is it in man? It says in the Psalms, what is it in man that you would even think of him? That's what the psalm says. And yet, look what God has done. Look what he has done. The thought can lead a soul to great love, to great time of affectionate prayer. Nothing else needs to be said. What could you say that wouldn't ruin in a sense, the fact that we come and we sit on the lap of our Lord and express as a little child does to its father its need, its dependence, and its love of the Father. That is what God made us for. And this, with these attitudes, this type of thinking, I believe, if a person were to take this and develop this, along with the mortification and penance that it needs to do to separate from the things that hold us back from God, I believe in a short time God would raise a generous soul to the heights of divine contemplation. That's my humble little opinion. And it means nothing, probably. But it's my thought. It's my wish for those who are generous. Our Lord will have the more glory in saving us. This is a beautiful point. If our misery is profound, let us have recourse to the great mercy of God and the multitude of his mercies. Our weakness so often experienced will bring into greater relief the power of grace. Our Lord will have the more glory in saving us. The gravity of our malady will show forth the wisdom of the divine physician. When a poor man has many misfortunes to plead his cause, it is then especially that he excites the compassion of the rich man and makes him open his hand. It is a great blessing to feel our weakness and powerlessness. It's a great blessing. That's what he said. Father Laodi. It is a great blessing to feel our weakness and powerlessness, provided that we say with the royal penitent, For thy name's sake, O Lord, thou wilt pardon my sin, for it is great. What closes the heart of God against us is not our miseries, it doesn't. It is our attachment to them 
our pride, which refuses to acknowledge our faults. And this is common. I have heard people say things where they express they cannot admit of their failure. They won't. It's frightening. Our spirit of independence, like the Pharisee. I depend on my good works. Therefore, God, you should hear me. Which will neither ask pardon nor obey, or want of faith which has not the courage to hope everything from infinite goodness. I mean, just the thought of this put together with understanding God's infinite goodness. You know what I will do? I will put the end of this on the web today. Okay? Because I don't have time to explain it. There's some beautiful things. And the book I found by Father Palu How can we make reparation by leading a simple Christian life? I just happened on it yesterday and I found some beautiful things in there that I I wish class were a little longer but it's best that you go and we will leave you with this and next week this was the foundation for the second half I wanted to get through today Um, but I'm kind of glad I didn't start it because this in itself is a whole understanding if you can think this way try to instill this into yourself as best you can and I'm going to try myself to do the same Because I believe if we do, God will be so generous. And he is looking for generous souls. He wants to fill you with his grace. Don't think of God as being sparing. He wants to give. He wants a saint. He wants many. But we have to learn the proper way to get there. That's what he's trying trying to teach us. And hopefully these authors can lead us to it. Thank you for coming. I hope to see you next week and we will continue on another beautiful subject and that is this whole thing now in regards to the Eucharist and the prayer of the Eucharist and the grace of the Eucharist that comes to you. That's next week. That comes to you basically with this as the foundation and I will explain next week. That's my introduction. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming.